Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. I am your host, Corey C., and I'm here with a very special guest today. I am here with Emma Haynes, the founder of Cassette Monkeys. How are you today, Emma? How's everything? I'm really well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing very well. I'm very excited to learn more about the intricacies of this project. I really am appreciative that you came on and, and are willing to speak with me about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to chat. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So let me ask you this, Emma. What exactly is Cassette Monkeys exactly? Yeah, so Cassette Monkeys, um, there's a bit of a backstory with, with how it came came about. Um, so it's it it's really phase one of a um, a web three business, uh, begins as a, an NFT collection. Mm-hmm. Um, but the backstory stems from my own experience with a prescription uh, medicine injury, which um, actually started because of a virus, a kind of coronavirus about 10 years ago. And I had this virus and I felt like I couldn't breathe properly for a year, but I wasn't believed by doctors. So I was going back and forth to the doctors. I went to a and twice in that year, complaining of breathing difficulties and was told nothing was physically wrong. So I ended up, I was doing a postgrad degree at the time. Um, I ended up graduating from that and I moved to the south of France, very beautiful part of the world, very relaxing. And I thought, Uh, If it's just stress, as the doctors are telling me, then everything will be sorted. Um, But three months into that, I got sent to a specialist who found my lung capacity to be at 60%. um, And I developed a kind of asthma off the back of this uh, virus. So because I'd gone a year without breathing properly and um, sort of suffered the effects of of what a virus can do to the brain, I I had very severe anxiety. So I was put on anti-anxiety medication. And I was on that for four years and I tried to come off it after a few months and doctors refused to let me come off it. And they said that I I needed to be on it. I'd never needed drugs before in my life. I traveled the world. I lived a very healthy life. We used to play football, soccer um, in the UK and it just didn't make sense. But I I trusted doctors as, as you do, as we all do. And I found out in 2016 after coming back to the UK because I was having all these heart palpitations and it didn't make any sense to me and the timeline fit with this drug but doctors were telling me that that wasn't the problem. I found out that I should have been given the drug for one week maximum and I'd been on it for four years at that point. So finding this out I cold turkey the drug. I just wanted to be off it, start a new life, be free from it and I thought it might be a really bad withdrawal for a few weeks or a few months even, but it ended up being five years. So I basically spent 2016 to 2021, uh, mostly housebound, pretty much isolated like the entire time. Of course, it crosses over with the pandemic as well. Um, and the same thing happened. Doctors were saying, there's nothing wrong with you. There's, uh, it's kind of all in your head. It's just, just stress, just anxiety. Um, and in 2019, I finally found out from a from a paramedic actually that um, it was the drug after all. So it's, uh, I found out in 2019 that it's a benzodiazepine. I'd never known what it was until that point. Um, And it's your likes of your Xanax, your Valium, all very common drugs that are prescribed. Yep. Um, And I slowly sort of began realizing what was happening um, and that I could have died from from cold turkey and this drug. And these, <laughs> these were the risks that were never, never told to me. Um, there was never any support, n- never any management, you know, proper management. Um, I'd literally seen tens, if not over hundreds of doctors saying that, hey, I think something's wrong, you know, whether it was with the virus or with the, the drug. And so the only kind of support system I had, aside from a few close friends, was, was creativity. So I, I really leaned into that. I started writing music and uh, decided to make a film, a documentary film about all of this. Um, When I got into Web3, I just realized the huge power of community building around NFTs. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna link link the two things together and make it a real sort of community project. And and that's where Cassette Monkeys was was born from. Emma, I have to say, I I feel like you're you're speaking, excuse me, to my story directly. And the reason why I say that is this, is I was also on a medication that I could not breathe as well. I was on a medication called Seroquel and um, I was on a, a, a decent sized dose. I was about 150 milligrams and it was the most terrifying drug I've ever been on. And um, I would constantly tell my psychiatrist that 
I couldn't breathe. I couldn't swallow. I'm, I'm now addicted to nail spray because I can't breathe. And I would say to her every time I went there, no, the, the, you're wrong. Like, I, I can't breathe. And she would be like, that's not a side effect. That's not a side effect. I'm like, do me a favor. Read your damn book in front of me and tell me if it's a side effect or not. So I waited there for five minutes and um, she said, oh, I'm like, what? You're right. I was like, yeah, I know I'm right. I know the way I feel. And I completely empathize with you as well as not being able to leave the house. And the reason why I say that is this as well, that that's horrible. And in 2018 to 2020, I couldn't leave the house as well. Um, my family is predisposed to anxiety. I wasn't, uh, I, I was actually on Xanax when I was in high school. And right now I'm on Celexa and uh, Lamictal and I'm trying to get off of them. And um, I couldn't leave my house from 2018 to 2020. I gained like 30 pounds. Um, and uh, we go by this notion that we're supposed to trust these doctors who realistically speaking half the time are just as clueless as we are when it comes to the, the, the side effects of these medications. And I've been on so many different medications, Remeron, Lamictal, the Prozac, Celexa, Zoloft, uh, Ambien, Adderall, you name it. And um, it, I feel like your story speaks to me and I really empathize with it because I, I understand what it's like to have a someone who you think is safe and trustworthy, prescribe you something. And then as a result, you have more Ill ailments that you need to be prescribed something else. And then that makes ailments and then you have to prescribe something else and so on and so forth. So I, I completely empathize with your story, Emma. And I really am grateful that you're speaking out and creating a, a documentary and, and, and reaching out to people that, that this, is a, um, this is a problem. So, so let me ask you this then, Emma, what's the premise of the film in your opinion? Like, what, how would you highlight this film? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, Corey, I just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing your story as well, because it's, it's not easy to talk about. And I think- No, it's not. You, you, when, when, when we share stories like this, um, it really revalidates the why, right? Like anything, anything that's worth doing ha has its difficulties. And, and I think what helps overcome those challenges with it is, is always remembering the why. Why are you doing this? Why does this need to be done as well? Um, and I, I was talking to a friend the other day who's been injured by pharmaceuticals too. And we were really saying that there's power in numbers because a lot of people um, just don't believe you, whether it's a doctor or whether it's somebody you're speaking out to. And I think, I think when we unite and we are open about these stories, it validates all the other stories. And it's, you know, we can't all be over-exaggerating or over-dramatizing or making this up. It's, and that's, luckily that hasn't been the main reaction I've had in recent times, mm -hmm. but certainly when I was on the drugs and, and trying to figure out what was going on, you just you just weren't believed. And I, I think there's a real extra cruelty layer, layer to it when it's, happening through the system that we're supposed to trust in most so um thank you for sharing your story as well i, I really appreciate that and oh, um, absolutely yeah um so uh, with with regards to the film um the the film is called playing with life the soundtrack and the the premise is that um because music helped me so much and creativity in general i decided that i was going to write the soundtrack for a film as part of the film itself and just set myself a really big goal of you know the 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 comeback is is stronger than the setback kind of narrative and so the aim is to write the music for the film put a band together and go on a world tour off the back of this five years of isolation and severe agoraphobia and torturous symptoms and, and everything that happens um whilst also obviously shedding a light on the issue raising awareness of the issue um hopefully being a um, a source of hope for people watching it, uh, regardless of if they have had any dealings with pharmaceutical drugs themselves. I think we're all going through difficult times right now in terms of the pandemic, mm -hmm. war, the peripheral effects of that. And I think if it can be a story that can show, you can be at rock bottom, real rock bottom for years on end, but then you can come out and do what you wanna do and live an even better life than you originally had. 
if there's a chance that I can make that story, I at least want to give it that chance. So that's the premise of the film. That's incredibly admir uh, admirable. And uh, I, uh, you say agoraphobia. Uh, uh, that's what I was. That's what I was uh, diagnosed as. Uh, you know, when you can't leave your house, or when you're uh, terrified of uh, leaving a certain mile radius, and um, it, it's just uh, it's a debilitating disorder. And uh, I, like I said, I couldn't leave my house for almost two years, and I felt like I, 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 I retracted back to being a child where I had to have a, a guardian twenty four seven because I felt like I was. Um, I don't know, I guess, too powerless to be able to um, stand firm in this world. And um, I really feel like I'm, I'm I, I, I guess fate plays its part because this is a very interesting conversation. And it's, it's almost like I'm, it's almost like the conversation that, that, that I need sometimes. And, and this is really amazing so far. And I really appreciate your conviction to speaking out. It's not easy to do that. So, in your opinion, Emma, what's your ultimate aim with both Cassette Monkeys and the film? Yeah, I think, I think the ultimate aim is for it to have a ripple effect on others that have gone through similar things. And by similar, I really mean adversity of some kind, um, which we all face at one point or another, um, especially during the, these times. Um, Specifically, our kind of mantra for Cassette Monkeys is creativity is the new medicine. Um, but it, there's, there's wider elements to this as well in terms of, so I was having a conversation with, with um, the team for Cassette Monkeys earlier and we were talking about, we can, we can share the awareness around these drugs and we can help people prevent going on them if they don't need them, which is probably the majority of people um, and, and sort of help create a culture of informed consent, which is severely lacking. Yes. Um, but aside from that, it's also about facilitating other options because these drugs are being prescribed for a reason. Mm -hmm. I, I was in need of some kind of intervention as with yourself, I'm sure, and everybody oh, ended up with drugs. So I think the, the kind of overall mission is really about helping equip people with the knowledge and the skills and the ideas that can enable them to live the, the healthiest, happiest life that they can and avoid going on these drugs um, that often can make things much, much worse. I absolutely agree with you 100%. The amount of times that, that I have personally taken medication that makes it even worse, like even right now, like I have this like strange twitch that I'm not sure if it's the Selexa or the Lamictal that's doing it. And um, it, it's, it's, it's baffling that we've grown as a society that's so accepting of pharmaceuticals and, and we nullify the 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 adverse effects that can occur with these pharmaceuticals and I find it to be I find it rather I find it because of the fact that it's all about profit it's about big pharma it's about big pharma becoming its own basically its own entity almost as powerful as as, as, as some governments and um, I find that to be a major issue. So, so let me ask you this then about Web3. This is, this is a very interesting concept you have here. What do you think Web3 can bring to the world that we, we haven't seen yet? Yeah, I, so I think, I think this links in perfectly with what you just said. For me, Web3, the thing that excites me most is the decentralized aspect of it, mm -hmm. right? Moving moving society into sort of paradigm shift away from monopolies yes. to power to the people. Um, and we, we, we're seeing that with DeFi, which is great, but I think there's huge scope in every other area. Um, decentralized medication, now how that, how that occurs, obviously there's many layers and discussions around that, but even in the sense that I referred to a minute ago in terms of equipping people with knowledge, that in itself is a form of sort of decentralized health and, and medication. Um, so I, I think really that's that's where that's where I'm most excited about it. It's it's about power to the people through education, through people being able to um, have the, their own careers and um, being able to connect with the communities that they most resonate with. I, I think it takes 
the whole essence of the internet and what we wanted to do with it and, and sort of up levels it to this next layer of, of true power because of the integration of smart contracts and, and the financial element as well. So yeah, for me, de decentralization. I, I absolutely agree with you. I, I, and as, as a person with a background in history, I, I, got, I went to school for education and history. Monopolies have always been dangerous. And uh, in the early 1900s, when uh, Theodore Roosevelt um, <clears throat> made the antitrust laws to break up monopolies, it's very surprising that monopolies have reared their ugly head back uh, into society. And, and now what's, what's more dangerous is that these, 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 this corporate oligopolist type ideal is now embedded into governments throughout the world. Specifically, I've noticed not much in the East, but in the West, Europe and America specifically. And um, I find that rather baffling because it's quite the opposite of uh, this notion of freedom that I'm hoping we enjoy. And um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a sad but inevitable truth right now that corporatism is, 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 is taking over the, the free market. And, that, and, that's not, and that's not free market capitalism to me. That, 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 that's a corporate status idealism. And I think decentralization is the only thing that can actually prevent that from getting any stronger. So let me ask you this then, because we because I, I know a lot of people they talk about the 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 essence of web three and that web three is is such a beneficial aspect in regards to decentralization. But if you had the power to change the totality of web three anytime you wanted. What would you change in Web3 if you could? Yeah, so there's a dark side to everything. And I think this is where, I think this is the biggest challenge for Web3 is how, how we facilitate that decentralization whilst protecting people. Because um, I think the thing that, that I, I worry about is, is sort of monopolies still being monopolies but through web3 and still kind of you know money makes money power breeds power yes. and it kind of doesn't matter what platform that's on uh, if 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 people are using those resources in in clever ways um it it, it happens on in real life web2 web3 so i think um yeah, I, it, it's, it's a difficult question to answer, but I think I would sort of, I would change the gaps that we're currently missing, which is what is the answer to that? And that's obviously um, not clear cut at the moment, but I think that's why it's important to have discussions around it. And hopefully as a, as a community and society, we can sort of figure that out in, in a fair way. And I had this exact, it's amazing how fate plays its part. I had this exact, <coughs> excuse me, conversation yesterday about cryptocurrency, which is basically intertwined with um, Web3. And I said to my guest, I said, how are we going to combat the ethos of what has happened in, in cryptocurrency and blockchain over the last 10 years? What happened was that cryptocurrency and blockchain were created to be a decentralized libertarian ethos that enabled individuals to create a sense of self-sovereignty, self-custody. They didn't have to rely on monopolies or nation states. And now I feel like the state and corporate entities have created a model where the only way cryptocurrency survives is if it is accepted through a corporate and nation state model. And the, the benefits of decentralization will not be as powerful because of centralized entities taking control. And um, I'm start and, and I and I don't understand why that's happening. And I think the only reason why that's happening right now is because we went through a, a three year bear market and everyone was just like, I, I just want to see the prices go up. So any any harbinger of, of new price of new price discovery, it doesn't matter. Let's let's bring them in. But now that libertarian self sovereignty, small government mind state is now being replaced by a more 
statist idealism in blockchain and and that, and that's 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 terrifying and people these maximalists that that claim to be so obsessed with bitcoin they're excited about el salvador adopting bitcoin they're excited about nation states drawing up drawing up systems for for bitcoin i don't know if that's a good thing i i, I personally don't think it is but again that's just my opinion but let me ask you this last question, Emma. What's been the biggest challenge you face specifically in Web3? And how did you overcome it? Yeah, I think it's funny because, again, it sort of links into to what you were saying um, in terms of people just wanting to see gains. And I think that's something we have to contend with as a as a um, collective in Web3 and also on a personal level, right? Like, I think we all have this inner battle with um, wanting to be secure and wanting to have the sort of Maslow hierarchy of needs, sort of those, those yeah. core foundational things taken care of, whilst also caring about the macro and, and society at large and the planet and, and everything else. Um, and I think the, the situation with um, sort of centralization and, and mass adoption kind of uh, speaks to that. Um, me personally, my, my biggest challenge um, has been with crypto. Um, and it's, I, I got into it about a year and a half ago. Um, I was introduced to it and I started learning about it. And I was, this is off the back of like quite severe neurological injury where I was struggling to even read things. And this is the first thing that kind of, I felt I was able to do. And I and I really got my teeth into it and and found it intriguing and I felt I felt a sense of hope again. So I, I had a little bit of cash that I started investing, and I, on not just one occasion, not just two occasions, but three occasions last year, almost made six seven figures on three different occasions, and it was my first in in crypto. I did not cash out at the right time. Um, one, I cashed out too early and then I saw it go to six figures. Um, the other one, I saw it go to six figures and, and I waited a while because I, I would have lost a lot with the fees at that point. Yeah. And, and then I saw it go down. And um, I had a, I think it was January last year that I had kind of a pot of cash that I was going to distribute between different, different uh, tokens. And um, I had a selection, a shortlist. And uh, one of them was Shiba Inu. And I thought, that's a step too far. You know, this is a meme of a meme. Don't do it. And of course, it's the one that had I gone in on, I would have made over a million pounds. And um, that messed with my head probably as much as the benzodiazepine injury, <laughs> because I had lost everything as a result of the pharmaceutical harm. And I'd, ha I'd been at the mercy of other people. I, I, I haven't been able to afford therapy. Um, I lost all this freedom that that money would have facilitated and allowed me to rebuild my life with. And in terms of making a documentary film, in terms of building a startup, I could have been my own angel investor and kind of been on my way and, and, and um, hired a, a large team of people to, to kind of um, shoulder the, the responsibilities with that. And so that for me was a real battle of, of, thought processes and and having to having to get very philosophical about it and sort of box it up and and frame it and and think about it in in a positive way so that I could move on with my life and not have feelings of regret or shame or you know self anger and, and all these things and I imagine that's something that all of us in this space have had to one degree or another because nobody can be in this space if you trade crypto and or nfts mm -hmm. none of us are doing perfectly all the time even if you've oh, made games you've missed out on games etc so for me that's been my biggest challenge but there's a lot that I've learned from that and I, it's an ongoing process but um yeah for me it was about framing it in a positive way and, and thinking about what can I learn from this how how can I grow from this and are there lessons that I've learned that I can apply to my future that might end up putting me in an even stronger position down the line and be able to help other people through that? And the answer was yes. And I think that in itself is very sort of um, medicating, I guess, uh, in terms of mental health. I have to say, I, I feel like you're, you're speaking again to my soul because I did the exact same thing in 2017. I got into cryptocurrency in May of 2017, 21 years old, 
no idea the concept of money. I was working at Petco making 9.25 an hour um, USD. So I don't know how much that is in pounds. I'm presuming it's around 12 pounds, uh, somewhere around there. Um, <clears throat> and um, I got into cryptocurrency and I put my life savings in cryptocurrency and I saw it go up to six figures. But at 21 years old, I didn't understand what that meant. I didn't understand what that could do. And I didn't, and I was more power hungry and in a state of megalomania um, than I ever had been before. And then when the market collapsed in January, uh, not January, in February of 2018, my portfolio went down to four figures. And uh, that, I like to call that the agoraphobic shock that, that I went into. And um, when that happened, I couldn't, I couldn't leave the house. I gained like 30 pounds. I was also at the time smoking cannabis every single day, mostly the strong cartridges that no one had a clue where they were coming from at the time. And um, I was able to overcome it by, by finding careers and not careers, but finding um, jobs here and there in this space. And um, I was able to cash out in May of 2021. And um, I, 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 I did well. I still live at home because I live in New York where 500 grand gets you a shed. Um, but I will, say, I will say this, that the, this story, Emma, is, is very inspiring. Like this is something that I really hope to God takes off. And I'd like to keep in contact. And when it's finished, I'd like to purchase it personally or see it in however way that I can, because this is an inspiring story. And um, I just hope to God, because you're going up against big pharma, that you're not canceled because of this cancel culture that we see when it comes to um, corporatism. I really hope that this, this makes a massive impact because it really needs to, because this normalization of pharmaceuticals, I, for black, I was put on Adderall when I was four. So um, I completely understand what you're trying to do. And I really hope to God that you are able to create a model for those in cryptocurrency and outside of it, that this big pharma is not here to help you 100%. And the doctors that are prescribing it are just as clueless as you are, and not, not you, but rhetorically speaking, they're just as clueless as you are when it comes to the, um, the long-term ramifications of pharmaceuticals, especially the strong ones that like, like Seroquel, which was terrifying, Xanax, which was terrifying, Benzos, horrifying, Ambien, I was on that too, horrifying. And I can only imagine what it would be like if I can go back in time and say to myself, what would my mind be like if I wasn't on over 25 different medications in 25 years? I don't know. And that's a question I'll never be able to answer. But um, I want to say, Emma, this was an extremely inspiring podcast. And I really want to keep in touch with you. And I really want to uh, see the progress that that Cassette Monkeys is, ha is having. And I'm really happy that you as a person were able to find an out in creativity and, and, and self-expression because uh, this is a trying time and a lot of people have been, have been um, uh, reliant on these medications now because especially with, with COVID from 2020 to even now, people are depressed, isolated, uh, disconnected, even though paradoxically speaking, we're more interconnected than ever. Um, this was an amazing conversation. This was a very moving conversation. I really hope to God that that this this takes off so god bless you and i really hope this works out thank you Corey. yeah i feel like this is this is this is the first time we're meeting this is our first chat and i feel like it's the first of many there's a lot of crossovers and mm -hmm. huge issue um it's a terrifying issue I, I i can only imagine somebody hearing this kind of story for the first time and going what do you mean we can't trust in in doctors or the system and, and there are many great people out there who are doctors um yeah, i agree but by and large it's a you know it's it's a very complicated situation where there just isn't 
isn't that knowledge as you say and um yeah if, if we can help help spread that awareness and informed consent that's that's what it's all about and i'll just finish by saying that i i can't believe you were prescribed these drugs from such a young age and i yeah i i wish we could all go back in time and use the knowledge that we now have um but i i will say that i think i think the the future is brighter for all of us now knowing this and being able to make informed decisions and and possibly end up being um wiser stronger people that can apply that to our own lives and other people's because of what we've been through that as much as i think we'd like to go back in time and change things um i think the silver lining is from everything that that we can we can match what's happened on the negative scale on the positive scale and apply that with the time that we we have left going forward Amen to that. Emma, I really want to stay in contact with you and I really want to have a follow up with you. And, and when this is released, please let me know because I, I will purchase it. And I, um, it. I, I really want to say that this spoke to my soul and you're a very inspiring person. And I really hope that this works out. Thank you, Corey. Likewise. Thank you're you. very welcome. Thank you for your time.